Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Amherst Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut <laughs> League of History Organizations. And I'm Emily Garfinkel, the membership and programs manager at the Connecticut League of History Organizations. Joining you today from the lovely CLHO office here at Central Connecticut State University. We're really happy to have you with us today um, for what I know will be a great program on safety and health hazards in museums and collections care. Um, we're joined today by Savita Trivedi, who's an industrial hygienist um, with uh, the Connecticut Department of Labor's uh, Division of Occupational Safety and Health. Um, and it is wonderful um, to, she's going to be sharing information with us today about some of the resources that are out there for us thinking about the museum as a workplace, um, the hazards that exist, and some of the help that, um, that Con OSHA can offer you as you're thinking about your workplaces in this way. Um, as usual, we're gonna have, um, Savita has pre uh, prepared a presentation that I think will be about half an hour, about 40 minutes or so. Um, so if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to use the chat um, to pop those in. And then Emily and I will be able to um, queue up your questions for Savita after she's finished her presentation. And then we'll have some time for a more open Q&A after she's done. Um, Savita, if there's any more uh, that you would like to share about um, you know, introducing yourself or your own background, feel free. But um, I'm going to mute us and hand things over to you. Um, and Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, sharing these resources with our community. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Savita Trivedi. I'm an industrial hygienist with Connecticut Department of Labor's uh, Division of Occupational Safety and Health, uh, where I've worked for over 25 uh, years uh, helping employers with safety and health hazards in the workplace. Although I've been doing this for a while, it wasn't until more recently that I started getting involved with museums, um, maybe in the last couple of years, and I find it to be a very exciting uh, workplace. There are so many diverse settings. We have art galleries, cultural institutions, historic building, and the sources of exposure are very diverse, um, along with a lot of unknowns. So it, it's um, an exciting area for me to work. As far as what I'll cover today, I just want to go over um, the AIJ uh, working group um, on museums, some information on injuries and illnesses at museums, and then a good chunk will be spent on some of the hazards associated with museum work. Um, and lastly, I'll talk about our consultation services that are available to you. There's a working group partnership um, between the American Industrial Hygiene Association, the American Institute for the Conservation, Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections, and with uh, OSHA's on-site consultation program. Um, and, you know, in the past, you know, we didn't really target, look at museums. Um, and so they were kind of under the radar as far as safety and health hazards. About 13, 14 years ago, there were a couple of inspections conducted at museums, a um, couple in the Chicago area. One was um, an employee complaint regarding uh, exposure to arsenic and lack of personal protective equipment. Um, and then there was another one, um, an inspection that resulted from a referral made from a physician. And he had found somebody with uh, symptoms of heavy metal poisoning. And so, like I mentioned before, generally before, um, museums weren't even on the radar for, for safety and health hazards. So this resulted in some inspections and findings um, as far as lack of personal protective equipment. And one of them they found em uh, employees might have been wearing cotton gloves more to protect the artifacts than to protect themselves. And in the course of the day, they see with the gloves, you know, um, 
which had uh, arsenic exposure, they're also touching, you know, they may touch their face, they may touch uh, doorknobs. Um, and so there was contamination. And in the other one also employees weren't, there was a lack of training and uh, lack of information about hazards that they might be exposed to. Um, so, so with this working group, what we're trying to do is uh, the mission is to create a forum that brings together occupational safety and health professionals with conservation and collection care professionals. We wanna raise awareness of safety and health in museums, produce risk assessment studies and evidence-based best practice guidelines, um, also develop core curriculum for museum studies programs. Um, in the past, it's been found that there, the studies um, at the universities uh, for museums, they didn't really include safety and health hazards associated with museums. So we wanna uh, change that and help develop a curriculums that include that. And with the ultimate goal of employees understanding hazards that they may potentially be exposed to and how to best protect themselves. I want, uh, I want to acknowledge Kathy Makos, um, retired from the Smithsonian Institute and chair of this working group, and Janice Rugels um, with the Smithsonian Institute that they were uh, nice enough to share some slides with me and some graphs. Uh, and some of the photos you'll be seeing are, uh, were taken from the Smithsonian and, and by Kathy Makos herself. When we look at the distribution of museums by discipline, this is from 2018, we'll see that the majority of them are historical societies and preservations, 14, over 14,000. Next, we have uncategorized or general museums. Then there's art museums, um, arboretums, botanical gardens, science museums, children's museums, and natural history. So with so many different settings, um, the hazards associated are gonna be uh, varied as well. If we look at the distribution of museums by OSHA's regions, we're in region one. Uh, so we have, um, according to this data, 27, 23 museums. And that would be region one consists of Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island. Um, so region, that's region one. You could see from the graph that the majority are in region five, which is the Chicago, Ohio, Illinois area. So they really have uh, work cut out for them. Now, looking at the trends that we are seeing in injury and illnesses amongst museums and historical sites, um, the majority are falls, slips, and trips. And this is similar to some of the other industries that we go to. So we're seeing some of the same type of injuries um, as we do in other work settings. So the majority um, that of injuries involving lost work days or falls, slips, trips. This was followed by overexertion, bodily reaction, repeated action. So, you know, if you think of the museum setting and heavy objects or um, objects that aren't easy to lift or having to move them around. So a lot of um, ergonomic type of injuries, musculoskeletal disorders. Also, we see contact with objects or equipment, exposure to harmful substances or environments, transportation, and the last one in the bottom is violence and other injuries by persons, animals, insects. So those are probably in certain settings. Um, but when we look at the exposure to harmful substances or, or environments, um, you know, this is for, for cases where it was reported and 
it was it resulted in a lost workday. But there may be many other instances where an employee may not associate symptom or some illness with the workplace. So it may be underreported. Now looking at the hidden hazards associated with collections. The challenge here is that there are many inherent properties of collections which may be hazardous. There could be toxic plants, minerals, poison, poisonous flammable liquids, but then there are also acquired properties such as preservation treatments with arsenic, lead, mercury, um, conservation treatments involving solvents and acid spaces as well as contamination uh, during storage. For example, mold, asbestos, or lead uh, dust getting into collections. Um, these can all be dangerous and have the potential uh, to cause exposure. Aside from the collections themselves, there's other hazards associated with preparation and processing of artifacts, such as separation of fossils from rock, so rock contains silica, so any cutting, grinding uh, of rock can expose employees to silica. There's hazards associated with conservation, like I mentioned, um, hazards associated with collection care and storage. There could be treatments, old residual treatments, arsenic particulates, vapors in cabinets. Then there's the fabrication and display. You know, some of the small museums probably are not doing this, but maybe mid-size, larger museums um, also are engaged in fabrication and displays. And then there's the hazards associated with historic structures, which this group may be familiar with. So let's go ahead and look at some of these hidden hazards. in historic work collections. So for example, technology, military, we may find carbon tetrachloride. There could be mercury containing instruments, cockpit radium dials, um, lead cadmium paints used in military pieces. In transportation, um, battery acids, asbestos firewalls. Um, asbestos has also couple of places um, people have mentioned where they've come across it in museums was in an old dollhouse where the wall panel was asbestos. Um, also in the airspace museum, there's a quilted jacket with asbestos. So we may find that it, it which is a normal mineral found um, in nature, it could be used in many objects. Medical and scientific, there could be old chemicals, drugs, vaccines, toxic fixatives in anatomical specimens. Um, in medical dental equipment, we could, we're could we also concerned about broken thermometers, which can leave mercury residue, ether or nitroglycerin, which can be found in doctor's bags, can become unstable over time and can even form explosive peroxides that are very sensitive to movement. This is, these could be found in historic works collections. We can have bottles of mercury, copper sulfate, poisons. Some of them could be flammable substances. Um, so there's a variety of um, chemical substances that could be found. And these old glass bottles, they're at risk of shattering and releasing contents. Um, I understand some of museums like to uh, remove the uh, contents, but want to maintain the bottles and the labels. These are some of the examples of hidden hazards associated with natural science collections. Caretakers of collections um, have, have used uh, 
pesticides to pre pre prevent pest infestation and to preserve artifacts. These efforts have led to the application of a wide variety of hazardous materials during preparation and storage. Um, sulfur has been used. Arsenic salts and soaps were widely used as a pesticide and preservative. It was used to coat the inside of specimen skin mounts or were applied to collection surfaces and storage drawers. Um, although no longer applied, the residual toxin is a serious hazard to collection ha handlers. There's also mercuric chloride. It was used as a pesticide repellent for botanical specimens. Over time, disassociated elemental mercury, which is a toxin, uh, can accumulate inside closed cases, posing inhalation risk. Um, so there's been both inorganic pesticides and organic pesticides. Mothballs, we see that a lot in uh, collections. Um, so here are some of the other ones, naphthalene, DDT, dichlorbose, lindane, fumigation with ethyl and methyl bromide, formalin, which is a formaldehyde solution um, for used for specimens. So in these photos, you can see um, ars arsenic on the paws of a study skin in a mammal collection, um, mercury sulfide graying on but on botany mounting, mounting paper. And um, in the lower left hand, um, alligator specimen was in a formalin tank. So you see in the lower uh, photo, employees are wearing uh, a mask to protect themselves from the formaldehyde exposure. So many different pesticides being used. Examples of hidden hazards in archives and photography. In the left, we can see this is an asbestos newsprint. Now, asbestos was considered a miracle drug. I think that's what comes from the term asbestos. It's like a miracle. Um, it's heat resistant, it's chemical resistant. Um, it could be woven into cloth. Um, so it was used. In, in many areas. Um, so also, I, I didn't even realize before that was used in newsprint. In the middle, we have deteriorating cellulose nest nitrate film. Uh, degrading nitrate film can emit nitrogen oxide gases when breaking down. Um, nitrous oxides are pulmonary irritants, and you may get a warning odor being emitted from it. Uh, so nitrate films are a major concern. They, they've been phased out before the microfiche was produced. Um, and then there's also mold, arsenic book covers, aniline dyes and book binding, acetate film degradation. Um, with the acetate film degradation, we can get uh, acidic acid that can cause irritation to the upper respiratory tract. Um, and it may emit like a vinegar type odor when breaking down. There could also be white powdery substances in old books. Could be flea powders or other powder-based pesticides. In textiles, we can see we've seen mercury felt treatments aniline and copper arsenic dyes, mold, there may be animal insect residues, pesticide residues, silk weighting with antimony, arsenic, chromium, lead, and ferret ferrocyanide. Um, the U U UV light acts um, on this latter one, and it can produce hydrogen cyanide. So it's, of course, all of these textiles, they shouldn't be handled without gloves.
we can see um, inherent contaminants in um, decorative and fine arts. Glass makers use small amounts of uranium to create yellow or green glass. The yellow tint of this glass led to the nickname Vaseline glass or canary glass. Under a UV or black light, the uranium causes the glass to grow, glow bright green. So we can see uranium colorants in Fiesta where the glass, there's metal pigments in paintings, ceramics or glass. Um, it could be cadmium, lead, mercury, chromium, cobalt. Cyanide in silver or gold plated objects. Oh, potassium cyanide was also used to clean some objects, leaving a white residue, which could produce hydrogen cyanide when wet. Lamp black and coal tar dyes, lead in sculptures. Uh, cadmium compounds were used as phosphors in neon sculptures and mercury was added to neon gas to create like a blue color. And also with contemporary art, there can be many different types of hazardous materials, including body fluids, sharp objects, broken glass, nails, toxic pigments. So some of the contemporary art has um, unique hazards as well. Examples of hidden hazards uh, with component deterioration. Until the early 20th century, uh, glass mirrors were produced using a tin mercury amalgam, which releases mercury liquid and vapor as it deteriorates. Mercury can collect in the edges of old mirror frames. It's reportedly safest to assume that anything before the early 20th century um, be treated as if it contains mercury. There could be asbestos in art plaster, uh, medicines, chemicals, powdering of lead cadmium paints. If it's flaking off now, it can cause, you know, as it flakes off, it can become airborne settle on surfaces, you go to sweep, it can become airborne. There's also ammuni ammunition, gunpowder, a spark could ignite gunpowder, wanna store it safely in a cool, dry place. Ammunition, we have to be careful of the powder inside the bullet, avoid heat. There's also hazards associated with collection care and storage. You may have incoming loans without hazard warnings. There could be radium dials, degraded chemistry sets, um, handling and decontaminating residual old treatments. Again, arsenic particulates. There could be vapor accumulation in cabinets, mercury, naphthalene, uh, use of local exhaust hoods, uh, is, is common and using HEPA vacuums to remove particles and insect fragments um, also used in many museums, not only to clean the object as we could see in this picture of the collection manager doing, but also for general housekeeping and storage and on work tables or phones or elevator buttons anywhere that arsenic um, I transfer from hands to gloves. And a couple of the museums that I, I went to, you know, they, they, especially the historic one, they make it, um, you know, a tub full with items and you don't know when you're going to open it, what's inside, what odors. Um, if it can be done within a hood, um, that's best practice. Here I have a couple of additional photos. These were some taken from museums in Connecticut. So here 
in one of the tubs, they came across a bottle of mercury, other liquids at the same place. There were a bottle of a flammable substance. And so here they wanted to dispose of, uh, of the contents, but keep the bottles, keep the labels. Here in, in a basement with storage and a lot of other items, you, it may be hard to see, but in the center there, there's a mirror. And again, um, you know, the tin mercury amalgam was used in mirrors from the 16th to the 19th centuries. And in this picture, um, you see these are all hat boxes. During the 18th to 20th centuries, hat makers used mercury to stiffen felts for hats. They used a type of mercury called mercury, uh, mercuric nitrate. Some workers inhaled mercury vapor and developed symptoms of chronic mercury poisoning, including psychosis, excitability, and tremors. These symptoms later became known as, they were given a, a phrase, you, I'm sure you're familiar with, mad as a hatter. Um, and Danbury, Connecticut became known as the hat city as it was the hat making capital of the world in the 19th century. At the peak of the industry, um, there were probably over 50 companies in Danbury that were making hats. Um, Danbury was, probably one of the main Norwalk, um, I think they made there also. Um, and in the 1800s, there was, there was knowledge that, okay, mercury is causing poisoning amongst these employees, but it wasn't until uh, like 50 years later um, when they started banning the use of it. Um, an interesting thing happened to me on a recent visit about a month ago I went to a machine shop in Danbury and I was, you know, I did the visit, a safety consultant was with me. We both did the visit. And as we were leaving, you know, I was looking around the office and I'm like, wow, this is a very old building. And um, so I said, you know, how old is the building and what was it used for? They had been in there since like 1955, but they told me that prior to them getting the building, it used to be uh, used for um, manufacturing hats. And so I asked the question, oh, really? Do you know if there's ever been any uh, monitoring done for mercury? And they said, actually there has, and it turns out it was a super fun site. I looked it up on, um, on our on the state website, it's a super fun site. And in 2001, they started investigation, investigating the facility, the facility and the grounds, and remediation started in 2020 of the contamination that was around the building. Um, luckily, the airborne concentrations inside were fine for the employees to work. But um, yeah, so from over a hundred years ago, the contamination was still, more than a hundred years ago, the contamination was still there. Um, this was in a museum I visited. Um, again, for first aid kit, you wanna watch out for broken mercury for thermometers. Um, in my reading on museums, I also learned that picric acid was sometimes used as an antiseptic in old first aid kits in the 1920s and the 1930s. As it dries out and crystallizes, it becomes a very unstable explosive. So around the time of World War I, um, there were kits with the picric acid pads. And here we have some clocks um, and watches. There was a Connecticut inventor and clockmaker, Eli Terry, that introduced, uh, who introduced mass production um, to clockmaking. And uh, I didn't realize that Connecticut became the clock manufacturing center of the world. 
there were, at one point there were over 280 companies in the Bristol area involved in clock making. But the clocks that have a pendulum um, from the early to mid 17th century clock, they used mercury um, as the pendulum weight. Uh, so as you could see in that center of photo, uh, these are sometimes, they were referred to as long case, tall case, or grandfather clocks, but the pendulum contains uh, mercury. Um, also, radium is a type of radioactive material that could be found in, in clocks. It was added to paints uh, as it has a glow. These paints were used on the dials of clocks and watches to make them glow in the dark. And... Uh, you know, radium is a radioactive material. Barometers also contain radiums and could, so you may have something in a collection that has radioactive material in it. It's important for museums, as you could see from some of these slides, you know, if we know that there's something hazardous in the collection, it's important uh, to have a system in place of communicating any known or suspected hazards uh, to the employees. These were some of the collection, some of the hazards associated with collections. Now let's look at hazards associated with facilities that may house these displays. So we'll look at some things. Hazards associated with facilities and structures. These may be very similar to what we find in, in other workplaces. Um, the difference here is the contents are unique and they may be of high value, um, but we see work being conducted at heights. Um, electrical hazards seem to be found no matter where you are. There could be bird droppings, asbestos containing material and lead-based paint are frequently encountered. Other issues include confined spaces associated with mechanical systems or pits. And one of the museums I visited, which was not a small one, it was like more of a mid-sized museum. Um, some of the displays they would do um, would be like uh, something hanging from a ceiling um, on a two, three story stairwell. And so for, for a museum like that, they would have to bring in outside contractors to um, get have scaffolding made. They also had a, like a fabrication shop uh, with normal machinery, uh, chop saws and other things that we see in other industries. Here's a slide with some hazards associated with historic st structures. Um, there could be asbestos containing material. It could be on uh, pipes, it could be on boilers, um, floors. Um, so it's good to do an assessment to make sure, you know, see if there is any asbestos material, but um, prior certain materials that were installed prior to 1980, we presume that they are asbestos containing, and that includes all your thermal system insulation, surfacing materials, uh, roofing materials. There may also be lead-based paint. Um, and so, you know, facilities prior to 1970, they could be lead-based paint. Um, if it's intact, both of these materials, it doesn't really present a hazard, but um, by touching the lead or by having damaged material, it can uh, release these materials. One of the biggest complaints seems to be mold. Um, and mold is ubiquitous in the environment, but when we have um, something gets wet or even high humidity, it's a, a good ground for the fungus to, to grow. There could be animal infestations, bird rodent droppings, inadequate means of egress. Um, 
if something was to happen and we don't have egress signs, exit signs, or exits are blocked, uh, that could be a problem. The picture on the left, do you see there's no railing going down the stairs? Uh, there could be overcrowded attics and other storage resulting in excess floor loading, excessive fire loading, slips, trips, falls, overexertion. Uh, again, remember the slide uh, about the major type of injury, so overexertion. Also, old electrical and mechanical system, lack of ground fault protection. Uh, there could be equipment that doesn't uh, um, accept locks to be able to have lockout, tag out in order to do electrical work, poor fire safety management. Um, so I don't know if any of these look familiar to people in the um, who work in these type of environments. Some photos I've taken, um, you know, here's some, there's been some water damage. And if you look at the wall, um, peeling paint, damaged paint on the floor, it's not easy to see, but there's all sorts of debris. So the concern here is if it's lead-based paint, um, it can present a hazard. Also, if you were storing your collections down here, um, you know, it could get inside boxes, tubs onto things. These are some photos of asbestos uh, containing material. On the left is a mudded fitting. Um, and this is damaged uh, and it could release fibers and asbestos fibers are so fine that you can't see them uh, visually. It would have to be, you'd see it on, under a microscope. They're generally you know, less than five microns in size. Um, and on the right side, again, asbestos, they're a different type of um, asbestos material. It could be aerosol insulation with the mudded fittings. This is a picture of some broken floor tiles. Floor tiles could get damaged uh, over time. Their uh, water can damage floor tiles, but some, some of the vinyl floor tiles, again, if it was prior to 1980, we've got to assume that they would contain, um, unless you have information to prove otherwise, or you have it tested, um, it could contain asbestos. And when these are intact, um, they don't pose a problem, but when they get damaged, it is a problem. There could also be physical hazards associated with collection care and storage. Sprains, strains from material handling. Look at the picture on the right, you know, imagine trying to work with that and if it's heavy, um, you know, bending over, reaching, these can result in injuries. There could also be lacerations from sharp shells, corals, glass, weapons. And then lifting and carrying heavy objects. They may be odd sized objects that you can't uh, hold close to the body. Working at heights, working with ladders. We want employees to use ladders safely. Um, some of the larger ones, museums or medium sized may have their own wood shop or paint booth. Um, so now we have all that equipment and we have to be concerned with uh, machine guarding, power tools may be used. So those are some of the physical hazards associated um, with museum work. Some points to consider I just wanted some industrial hygiene concepts. What are the roots of exposure? The primary route of exposure um, for chemical substances is by inhalation, by breathing it in. That seem, that's generally the primary way of getting exposed to a chemical substance. And how can we you know, correct that? Could be local exhaust, increasing ventilation, and maybe as a last resort, PPE like a dust mask or respirator. 
Um, but if we can engineer out um, the problem, that's the best way to go. Next, there could be skin absorption. So that's why it's important for us to look at personal protective equipment. In the case of that inspection I mentioned, where they were using cotton gloves, it was to protect the artifacts, not to protect their skin. Um, so we may need nitrile gloves or some other type of gloves to prevent absorption. Um, third, ingestion. Now, no one is going to be going to the museum and um, you know licking any of those artifacts, but poor hygiene practices. If someone was to um, be handling a frame with uh, lead and cadmium and then go have a cigarette or go eat, not use proper hygiene practices, that's where we can have inadvertent ingestion. Also, another thing to keep in mind is that the hazard versus risk. Um, so material hazard is a basic property of nature or construction. It's inherent in that material. But risk is the degree to which the hazard is able to affect your body system. The hazard may be difficult to change, but your risk from the hazard can be controlled. And this is where we want to come in and help uh, employers and employees. For example, if you're using formaldehyde fixative, it's a high hazard carcinogen. But when it's used within an exhaust hood, the risk is low. Moving a heavy, uh, moving a heavy box, um, presents a hazard. We can replace this by using material handling equipment to reduce the risk of muscle strain or trauma to the body. So uh, that's where we want to focus our attention. You know, some of the artifacts you may have, they may have some inherent hazard associated with them, but we want to manage that risk. Now that we've covered some of the hazards associated with museum work, and this was very brief, you know, there's many um, hazards that I haven't even touched on, but let's let's talk about where you could get some help. OSHA has an on-site consultation program. It's one of the best kept secrets in Connecticut. It's an excellent program. Employers that use it tend to call us repeatedly. Um, and let's look at what it involves. It's a voluntary program. We don't just come out to any workplace. We have to be invited in. It's free of charge. And it's separate from OSHA enforcement operations. People hear the word and you know they may be reluctant, but we uh, work independently of enforcement operations. The great thing, there's no charge for the consultation program. There's no citations or monetary penalties. Um, if you requested any monitoring, um, if we did some air sampling for uh, contaminants, um, that's all free of charge. So there won't ever be any charge. The findings are confidential. So I've gone to museums, but I'm not going to share the names or what I find. Um, you know, with other employers. So all our findings are confidential. Where on the enforcement side, it's public information. Uh, with the consultation program, everything is kept confidential. We just want you to correct any serious hazards that are found. So the goal of the consultation program is to help employers identify and control workplace hazards. Um, it's generally, it's geared towards smaller employers. If you think of the large institutions, they have a full safety and health staff. Uh, smaller ones might not have the resources. You may have only one or two employees doing 10 different tasks. Um, so that's where we could come in. Um, for smaller employers, we can talk about work practices to minimize exposure the use of personal protective equipment, personal hygiene practices. We can watch how, how things are done. Uh, normally when I go to a work site and somebody's doing a plating operation or at a foundry operation, 
you know, part of it is just watching, you know, the work practices and then see, you know, what can we do differently. Same thing with ergonomic related problems um, to prevent uh, musculoskeletal disorders. Um, and then talk about communicating hazards, proper labeling and signs on containers, shelves, cabinets. How are you going to, um, you know, the information you have on any hazards, how is it gonna be communicated? Um, we have both industrial hygienists, I'm one of the industrial hygienists. We look at the health hazards, but we also have safety consultants um, who would look at things like machine guarding, egress, electrical hazards, um, confined spaces. Um, so you can request either an industrial hygienist to come out or a safety consultant. The, the process um, involves someone in management um, calling us and requesting the consultation, um, letting us know what, what you need help with. You can make it as limited or as comprehensive as you want in scope. Um, and then we walk through, if there's any monitoring, we do the monitoring, um, air sampling, um, or if, there, if you need help preparing some of the programs, for your employees who can help with that. We generally follow it up with a report. Um, and then if there's anything serious that needs to be corrected, would correct it, let us know, and, and that's it. And um, like I said, many of the employers who have used our services, you know, they may call me now, and then a year later, they come across something, hey, Savita, can you help me with, with this one item? And I, you know, we're happy to come back out. And so that's how the consultation program works. Um, here's uh, my contact information down below. And if you are interested in requesting a consultation uh, visit, uh, you can go to our website, which I have here. There's also a phone number. You can call and say, I'm interested in a consultation. And it could be um, a health consultation or a safety consultation. Um, or it could be both. And so that's what I have. I'll give you a few minutes to write this down. In the meantime, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. If you think of any questions at a later time, feel free to give me a call or e you know, a call. Um, email's probably easier for me. So now we'll turn it to questions. And let me see, how do I see this? Great, I can um, lob these to you, uh, Savita. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so um, that was incredibly informative. I, we had a couple of questions come through, um, some of which have been sort of like somewhat addressed in the chat. It looks like we've got um, some uh, some folks with some expertise in collections care here as well today. Oh, okay. Um, Valerie yeah, yeah. had asked about um, sort of the dangers of lamp black. Um, and uh, the wonderful Tara Kennedy from Yale was um, offering some information on this um, okay. as a carbon particulate it can be a respiratory irritant, um, but uh, depending on the application of lamp black, um, I don't didn't know if you had anything more to add to yep. what Tara had put yeah. in there about um, the potential hazards of lamp black as a substance. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's great that Tara Kennedy is here. She's uh, she's part of that working group that um, I mentioned, and she's an expert in the museum field. You know, I'm, I'm not a museum person. I, um, I'm the industrial hygienist. So, but if there was a concern like carbon black, if there was some work going on and there was a concern, we can certainly come out and look at it. It's going to be considered particulate. There's a uh, permissible exposure limit for it, uh, which we could check. We can also do for certain contaminants, we can do uh, wipes, um, bulk material. I, I know with the artifacts, you're, you're not going to be disturbing any of the materials and you know they're intact, they're fine. But if you had some flaking material, some um, or, or some concern that you're working with something and it's generating dust, 
um, that's, that's an area where I can come out and do some sampling or um, look how it's done and see if we can do it in a, in a safer way. Thanks. Was there something you wanted to add, Tara? Because I think a lot of the thing of, that uh, the, a lot of the great information that uh, Savita has pro provided for us is about context, right? So something like carbon black, for example, like I think in a lot of cases for doing testing, it's often in a setting where it's an artist workshop sometimes. Like if someone were to be using carbon black in a way that was resulted in a lot of like particulate dust, um, I can't think of an application off the top of my head. Um, but that might be an instance where you would want to call um, OSHA to come in and do the on-site consultation. Um, but if you have something where there's printing ink that's already been on there for hundreds of years, like that's not something you got to sweat, if that if that makes any sense. Like, Savita, would you agree? Yes, yeah. So like I said, you know, it, it, we have to look at the hazard versus the risk. Right. And um, so that would be an instance like maybe we don't have to worry about it and it's just best practices. So some of this might not be, you know, might be communicating the hazard, how to communicate, how to protect yourself using proper hygiene. Um, what I've done also with uh, museums is give them some resources that I've gotten through this working group on um, collection-based hazards, point them in the direction. So just having that awareness, I think it's great for, for employees. I think that's perfect. And that's this, and your presentation certainly highlights a lot of the different things that people need to look out for. It's yeah. more like you just don't want people, don't, people don't need to be scared. They just need to be aware. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I definitely don't want people coming away from this presentation today being like, oh my God, everything in my collection is completely terrifying. Right. You know, I think that, you know, it's also, it's been sitting there for a long time. And, you know, so, um, but, yeah. you know, I think that it, it really, I think Savita's framing, especially I think around, you know, hazard versus risk really helps us think through that. Right. You know, there are substances right. that, you know, we're all aware of in our collections or even in our buildings that are like, well, you know, we kind of wish it weren't exactly like that. But, you know, it's a, definitely about thinking about that risk mitigation, right? And that seems right. to be, um, you know, where the, the expertise is really um, so incredibly valuable. Thinking, you know, learning how to look at that stuff in an informed way and then thinking about like, okay, how do I go about my work safely given the fact that this is here? Um, there was a question from Lenny um, that uh, was kind of about um, about whether hazards such as those you described, whether they have presented challenges to museums for getting insurance. Um, and Tara had kind of bumped that up as a question she was quite interested in as well. Yeah, and I, I don't know the insurance aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, but but you know, as far as like injuries, illnesses, if we try to do things safely and you know avoid the slips, trips, falls, especially the musculoskeletal disorders, and you know, as far as workers' comp insurance, I would think that would be go down if you didn't have those kind of cases. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also good to keep this in perspective too, right? I mean, sure, Savita, that you visit a lot of workplaces with a lot of hazards, you know, where, you know, despite the yeah. fact we're certainly, I mean, you know, need to be aware of the hazards there. The museum is right. not the most unsafe work environment that's out there, right? No, um, you know, yeah. so, you yeah. know, <laughs> and other, other kinds of businesses can get um, insurance for their employees and for themselves as well. So, um, yeah, that's a great question, Lenny. It doesn't sound like we have too much insight into that, but it doesn't sound like it's something um, you need to be worried about in particular. Right. Right. Um, okay. there, um, I'm not seeing a whole bunch more um, uh, questions in here. Um, Tiffany um, had a, a comment just to, if you have any affiliation with the university, um, you, you know, you can tap the geology department um, to see if it has uh, x-ray fluorescence, portable x-ray fluorescence equipment to help determine the composition of materials and contaminants. Um, so 
I, I don't know if you have anything to um, add to that, Savita, um, before we go. Other resources that might be out there um, or a part oh, of that people could, you yeah. know. Yeah, uh, you know, where one resource, there could be um, instruments at universities, um, other museums, they could check with the associations. Uh, so they're, you know, we're just one of the resources that could be used. Yeah. But there are others, and I'm sure Tara's very familiar. I'm sure Yale must have instruments um, that are used. Yeah. Great. You know, so if they can be a partner. And again, if this wasn't meant to scare anybody, because if you think about it nowadays, just about everything around us, we hear everything's a carcinogen or something. Right. But it's just, it's just to be aware of what you have and, and just take precautions and manage the risk the best you can. Well, as always, um, the recording of this will go out in a follow-up email from Emily, along with um, some of the resources that Savita has pointed to, um, you know, links, perhaps we can link to if that working group has a website, um, you know, and then the information on your last slide here um, on, you know, sort of next steps. Um, and I also wanted to sort of elevate Kathy Krogwell Varda's comment that like, if you see anything in this presentation that has made you worried about something in your own collection, you can also find a qualified conservation professional um, who you can uh, contact through the American Institute of Conservation. Um, and Kathy would be one of those people, I would say. Um, so, um, Savita, I want to thank you so much for, um, for this excellent and informative presentation. Um, I think it can be a resource for all of us here in the field. Um, and uh, we're really just very grateful to you for sharing um, not only this information, but also the information about the um, consultation program, which sounds so promising for our organization. So I hope you get a lot of follow-up emails from folks. Um, sure. and thank, thank you, you again very much. Thank time. you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all hopefully soon at the CLHO annual conference, which um, is going to be on June 5th here at Central Connecticut State University. And um, we'll be opening up registration within the week. Um, so you can look for uh, your email for more information about that. Thanks again to Emily, to Savita, and to all of you for being here. Um, special thanks, thanks to um, Tara and Kathy for sharing your expertise in the chat as well. Um, have a great day, everyone. Hey, thank you. Bye.